My name's Les McQueen. Um, my background was in nursing. Um, but for the last 15 years of my working life before I retired, did I tell you I retired? 18 months ago, um, I had the pleasure of working with um, the AHP groups and committee on the quality improvement programme. Thoroughly enjoyed every minute. So much so that I begged them to let me come back to do this final presentation um, of this kind of way the programme's running. Um, it's been a while since I retired. However, I remember back to the early days when I first started delivering training. Um, I would be delivering team training around um, ophthalmic nursing issues. Um, then I progressed on to doing large conferences to 200 people. And then most of the time in Greater Glasgow and Clyde, it was probably anywhere between kind of 30 to 80 people um, delivering presentations. I'll have to confess that even now, the wee image on the left-hand side of being scared and hands up and a bit nervous is still there. Um, I would worry if it wasn't, um, because you never know what your audience is going to be like. So the whole point of doing this is to try and instill a wee bit of confidence in you. And whether you're presenting to your, your own team or small teams of people, or whether you're presenting to larger groups. Hopefully by the end of this wee session before the coffee break, you'll, you'll, you'll feel a wee bit more confident. So I think what we'll do is if it's okay, we'll just crack on. Right, okay. If we're looking at presenting, the thing that's really key up front is to make sure that people understand what the outcomes are of your presentation. So, this is about how do you gain people's interest and confidence. And the key thing there for me is that you've got to explain things to people up front and get them to understand the importance of things like presentations and um, poster development. So again, for you guys that are participants on this course, these are the kind of outcomes that we're hoping you're going to achieve. And, and once you've got that in your head, you can think about how am I going to share this knowledge and this information with people? And again, whether that's in front of a face-to-face -face group of people um, or whether it's in front of a Teams Zoom call type thing, but it is important that you have that confidence to be able to kind of explain things. We did ask for a wee bit of information up front. Um, Shona kindly put a wee email out or polling saying, what, what was your experience to date so far of presenting? And I'm just wondering if there's any to, to share. I did get a couple of responses, but if there's anybody willing just to share a wee bit of information on what it felt like or what it feels like to be presenting. Gillian Ward, do you want to kind of unmute yourself? Is that okay? Sorry, you suddenly I couldn't find mute. <laughs> Um, no, it was just you were, you were asking about experiences, so I was just going to say in beginnings of um, presenting is um, yeah awful for somebody who maybe isn't that way inclined, so terror and just awful, but actually having ended up in a job where I needed to do it more often, it's a practice thing and you get better and Teams is kind of a whole different skill set, but at the same time it can be easier in some ways as well because you're I don't know. Um, I have to present to quite a lot of people in a training thing quite often, and there's a kind of um, a slight distance, which is not quite the same as being in the same room as people. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's even looking at people on Zooms, it really is difficult to gauge the kind of what, get a sense of the feeling that's in the room, and are people enjoying it, or are they happy, and or are they beginning to look a bit bored and closing their eyes? Fortunately, nobody's doing that so far on the screen. So, yeah, in, in a couple of the responses that came back, people were saying that it is quite nerve wracking. And if you're, if, if you're a wee bit apprehensive and you're not sure about the topic and the subject, then that can sometimes make it even worse. Basically, your role as a presenter, if it's a face to face meeting, you have to check a few things before you get into the room. So you might want to check things like, um, is there any fire alarm tests? Is there any codes to get into the building? For me as well as looking at that background stuff, it's about how am I going to make sure that on the day I've got everything I need? So the key thing about going to the venue that you're going to be delivering in is you can check things like the IT equipment. Is it, am I familiar with it? Um, do I need to take 
up things on a memory stick or for me personally when I was delivering I always used to take some hard copy copies of the PowerPoint or the presentation so that as a last resort if I couldn't get things sorted or there was IT failures at least I would still be then able to deliver the presentation. Teams and Zoom calls as you've experienced so far this morning can be a bit more difficult um, there is issues where presenters lose control, Shona. <laughs> um, there, there's also issues around the, the thing that I'm noticing now is like the delays and responses. So again, it's probably just about trying to think about how do I overcome that? How do I learn not to panic? And I think, again, for me, when you're presenting, the key thing is to try and stick to time as much as possible. So we said earlier that we're definitely going to have a wee break for a coffee and things part way through this. So given that we've had a wee bit of kind of technical hitches, I'm going to try my hardest to get back on track and, and start making sure we catch up. And like I say on the slide there, even if it means that I only give you some key messages. So I think if this next slide comes up, Don't you just love it? Here we go. So if this is about how to build your confidence when you're presenting. The key thing for you is that you already know your topic. So you've got the confidence that you have worked on your project, you know what it is you're trying to achieve from the project, and it's about how do you share that with people to make it meaningful for them. You can reflect back on previous sessions that you've maybe been a participant in. So presenters who were terrible because they didn't engage with audiences or the one thing that used to really get to me was when people would be looking at the audience and instead of looking at the laptop screen, they would be turning to look at the screen behind them to see what it was they were going to say. And yet there were some presenters I've been on that have just been fantastic. They engage with you straight away. They get your attention. They throw in a wee bit of humour here and there. And that makes things more memorable. So I think key is when you're trying to build your confidence, try and think of some of the presentations you've been at that have worked really well, where things have kept your interest and things have been kind of, it's been made memorable for you. I... I had the, the fortune um, with the committee and the team to have a wee practice So um, before we did this session. So again, although I'm retired, did I tell you I'm retired? Um, I still class these people that are um, in the, the, the QIP programme as my peers. And they've been great helping me support um, getting familiar with teams, tweaking and things, the um, presentations that I'm working on. And that's something you've got as well. You can always try wee rehearsals and wee run-throughs. Um, one of the things we used to do in the programme um, or in the past was I would actually um, run some wee practices. So a few weeks before the actual um, QIP event where you were presenting, we used to get into a lecture theatre. Participants, we, they ought to turn 10, 15 minutes or so at a time to actually have a, a go at working through the presentation. And the good thing there was that for the rest of the people in the audience, they could pick up on things and give you constructive feedback. One of the things that um, sticks out for me is whenever I was training, I would always say things like, do you know what I mean? Now, somebody in an audience once counted the number of times I said, do you know what I mean? And it's not until you get feedback like that, that you then also start to realise how often you say M. Or other wee irritating things like how you're, you keep, I don't know, trembling a wee bit or you, 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 you make funny gestures that you normally wouldn't make. One of the things that we noticed about the rehearsal was that before we introduced that, that there was a lot of nerves from people presenting and that the quality maybe of some of the PowerPoints wasn't as good as it have could, could been. And there was a noticeable difference in the presentations once people had attended. And the more we did the rehearsals, the more people got confident. And it wasn't just us in the committee saying that these are much better. We were actually getting a lot better in terms of evaluations and people were saying that the standard of presentation was really, really good. So all these wee things around knowing the content, 
about thinking back to presentations that you've been on that have worked well, making sure that you tap into your colleagues and your peers and get them to listen to you. They may well be losing the will to live having listened to you rehearsing 10 or 15 times, but it's well worth it because your colleagues will help you. And again, for me, the three words there, practice, practice, practice. Since I got invited back to do this, I probably every two days have been flicking through the PowerPoint, jotting wee notes on a bit of paper and trying to remember what was it I did the last time that made it enjoyable for people. So if we move on a wee bit, this for me when I was working in learning and education or when I'm presenting, these are the key principles that I think will make a presentation memorable for people. And the first when you're introducing your presentation, you're basically telling people what you're going to tell them about. So they've got a clear understanding, tell them about your project, what outcomes you were aiming towards or what improvements to clinical practice that you wanted to make. When you're developing and working through your presentation, just tell them about it. Now, you don't need to use jargon and things like that. You can keep your language quite simple. But again, it's about how do you engage with people and get them interested at the beginning and then just tell them about what it is you've been working on. If you then at the end of your presentation tell them what you've told them, they will remember it. And for me, the evaluations that we used to get in learning and education or in the previous QIP programs, by using that process, the evaluations tended to be really good and people remember things really well. So I, I would still, if I was invited out of retirement, did I tell you I was retired? I would still use these principles about telling people. I also use this with my, my, my sons, they're 21 and 23, and it works, works for them, helps keep their bedrooms tidy and things like that. So um, I'll move on a wee bit. So if you're looking at beginning your presentation, your introduction, you need to tell people what the title of it is. And for me, the title has to be really interesting, something that attracts people's attention. When I used to work with colleagues, there may well be theories and models and things they want to explain, but if you introduce your topic by saying something like, here's something that's going to make a difference to your practice, or here's something that I know you're going to find really interesting and exciting and I want to tell you about it. So again, it's about how to get people interested and on board. They need to be clear about what the purpose of your presentation is because there are some people in audiences that will want to be there. There are some people in audiences that will have to been told to be there. And there are some people that are in the audience that are not quite sure why they're there, but they're thinking they may or may not get something out of it. So again, you need to be clear about the purpose and the need. You then need to be thinking about what are the objectives? What do I want people to get out of? this presentation. So for me, whenever I was delivering, I would always look at what was the end outcome that I was looking for? And then I would start to work backwards and think, so if that's what I'm hoping to achieve, what do I need to do to achieve that? And how do you at least get people interested enough to listen to what it is I want to do? There are three things now, Shona and the rest of the girls on the committee, they'll say, this is my mantra, there are things called must, shoulds and coulds. Now, whether this is relating to your clinical practice, and if I think back to my nursing days as a charge nurse or a nurse practitioner, there were things I had to do during my working day. The must, things that if I didn't do them, something really bad would go wrong. There are other things that you should do, but whether or not you get the time to do it depends on how well or how quickly you work through the must do's. And there's always things that you could do to people or tell people. Um, and a wee example of that might be, I must make sure, for example, that um, my patients all get their medicines. I should try and make sure that in addition to their medicines, their other healthcare needs are met, like their diet requirements, their comfort, ensuring their safety. And then I could also make sure that I try and get the Christmas off duty done. So it's a bit prioritizing the musts, the shoulds and the coulds, and it's exactly the same with your presentation. You may well start off with all the shoulds and the coulds that you have to get in, but it's, for me, it's about refining that and maybe bringing it down to two or three key messages that you want people to get out from what your presentation is. There's another wee thing that I, oops, 
I'm away again. Uh, in addition to the must, shoulds and coulds, this is something that might be of interest to you. If you've got people in a room for, say, an hour or two hours, their concentration levels begin to wane after about 20 minutes. If you're also presenting amongst a group of presenters, and let's say you're the second or third one on, <clears throat> people will probably be getting a wee bit low on kind of the death by PowerPoint, or they'll be trying to move from one topic to the next topic. And, and that makes concentrating on what you're saying a wee bit harder. So one of the things I used to do, if I was like, say, not the first speaker of the day, if it was maybe the second or third person that was that was presenting, I would always start off with something a wee bit interactive, something just to get them to think a wee bit. I might ask them a question. I might throw in a couple of wee fun quiz questions, that kind of thing, just to help people have a wee bit of relaxation before you then get into your presentation and into your PowerPoint. So I think it's worth doing that because when you're presenting even for a longer period of time, this is really important. You need to break up your presentation into small chunks. If you've got a short presentation and you're the third or fourth one on at that 20 minute period, just have it in the back of your mind. What, what can I do here to get people to have a wee break before I really get into it? And they'll get much more out of your presentation if you do that. I love this Teams. The, the delay is great. It gives me time to think about what I'm going to say next. And that's a key thing when you're presenting. Don't feel that you have to rush through things. Just take your time. You'll get there eventually. If you find that you're overrunning in time, then that's when you come back to using what must I tell people about and some of the shoulds and coulds can go. When you're actually trying to continue or the, the main part of your presentation, it's important that you review the content and summarise things. Quite often what we used to do in learning and education was we would have a set of outcome slides at the beginning then we would revisit the slide that had the outcomes on it and we would just run through them again. We would then engage with the audience and say, do you feel we've met these outcomes or have your objectives been achieved? If you wanted to test people and find out what they got for the session, then there are, there are some kind of methods to do it here. So quizzes are often a good thing, a wee quiz at the end of it, a bit of fun. I, I was kind of notorious for handing out certificates or giving people curly whirlies. Or I would always bring some with me, which I've got here. You can have a virtual quality street if you want. So there's wee incentives to get people to participate in things like your quizzes. We were chatting about this earlier. Before we did this session, we thought about maybe we could do a questionnaire before and ask people what their level of confidence or experience was and then repeat that at the end. That can be, say, a week or two weeks later because, again, when you're reviewing um, people have gained you've got to be aware that some people are quite reflective and they may want to go away and have a wee think about what they've they, they've got out of the session so pre and post questionnaires or both are ways of actually kind of making sure people have understood what it is you've been talking about i also used to try and get people to commit to doing something after it now that might just be one thing like changing an aspect of the practice or um, one of the things that Sean and the girls used to take the mickey about me was when anybody asked me how was I, I would say I'm living the dream. And people would say, no, really, how are you? And I'd say, no, I'm living the dream. And what I'd like you to do is go away and find occasions where you can email me or text me or message me and tell me that you're living the dream. Or it could be a practical task. Go away and try working with a particular, um, I don't know, spreadsheet or whatever it is I was teaching on. Um, testing questions, again, when you're in an auditorium and you've got people there, you can throw a few questions. You can then engage with people because you can do things like you can walk towards the person that's asking the question. Or if you think there's some people in the room that are not really engaging with this, you can throw open questions here and there just to try and make sure people have understood what it is you're talking about or something at the session. But again, this is much harder to do via Teams. I'm looking at a wee row of faces on the bottom of the screen here, and it's really difficult to tell. Does somebody want to ask a question? I've got a couple of people that are nodding and giving me facial expressions to tell me that I'm actually doing no too bad, although I am trying to watch my time. But are on Teams to, to, to get this kind of feedback, and how do you make sure people have really understood what you've said? 
these are just things we're throwing in when we don't have answers, but it's all things that you might need to consider. When you're ending your session, one of the things that I always, always would advise you to do is thank people for the participation. Because again, if you think back, I said earlier on, there are some people that will want to be there and some people that maybe don't or have been told to be there. Nevertheless, it's really important to thank people for their participation and engaging with you. Obviously, the obvious things are re recap on what it is you've covered, using the tell them about um, your, your topic and, and closing, um, have they achieved outcomes and that kind of thing. And people often get nervous when they have a slide up saying any questions or a question mark. And what you're hoping for as a presenter that nobody asks anything. Because by then you've had so much of an adrenaline rush that you just want to get off that stage or away from the auditorium. However, if people ask you questions, that's another way of engaging and, and checking that they've actually been listening to you and that they've got things that are maybe not clear of or things they want to do. If you get a question and you're not really sure about the answer, one of the things you must not do is try and fluff your way through an answer because you'll start to mumble, you'll start to get nervous and people will actually, you maybe lose your credibility. If I got a question or a really bad question that I thought, oh geez, I've never thought of that. Oh, why did they ask that question? I used to try and make people feel good by saying, do you know, that's a really, really good question. I need time to think about that and I'll get back to you. Because if you don't say that's a really good question or give them a wee bit of feedback, mm, that's interesting then they may just again think that, well, this guy doesn't really know what he's talking about. So it's about how do you make people feel, appreciate that they've actually that you, you think is really important to go away and find out a bit. And I think the thing as well is that once you've done your presentation, it's about what's happening next. So if that means in terms of your project, you're further developing it or you're waiting for results, it's a bit important that you tell people what the next steps are or what next steps you want them to do or take out of the, the session that you've been running. This is really hard. See, if I was in an auditorium with people face to face, I'd be mingling with you and getting it sweet, trying to keep you going, but it's really hard. Um, again, when you're engaging with the audience and it's face to face, it's really important that you smile and say hello and tell people who you are. Um, I think a smile helps relax people, um, it chivies them on a wee bit, gets them to think, oh, this is going to be interesting because this person is very pleasant. And again, when you're engaging with the audience, they'll expect you to tell them how your session's going to run. They want to know what your session's about. They need to know things like, is it okay to ask questions during it or do you want me to wait till the end? So again, make people are, are like really understanding. And, and that, that can happen when you take charge of a session. I had a wee technique that when I used to go into training sessions or, or delivering presentations, I would obviously be nervous and apprehensive. But one of the techniques I had was I would clap my hands, smile and say, good morning. That was me switching on from, oh, from nerves and apprehension into that taking charge role. So it was about getting people's attention and saying, this is how this session will run. Here's what I know you're going to get out of it. And, and, and really trying to get people to understand that, that you were in charge. If you're in a face-to-face -face meeting, well, that you tend to get a few throw questions out or you may get people talking in the background on your slides. And it can sometimes be difficult to actually engage with the person asking you the questions. So again, if you're in charge, which you should be, don't be frightened to ask people to quiet and do a wee bit because you can't hear what the questions are that are being asked. Um, I was delivering the core program once and there was two or three people at the, the, the back of the auditorium at Glasgow Royal and I could see them talking and <laughs> when it got to the coffee break, apparently someone came up and said, do you realise that they were on their mobile phones and they were looking at things while you were presenting and they were and again, that's just rude. So when I saw people talking again, I would say, excuse me, just for a laugh, put your phone in, put the newspaper away, because I can't hear what these people are saying. So again, don't be frightened, take control and make sure that you, you get control of the audience, that if you need to ask for a bit of quiet, you do it. Speech. What do you think is important about speech? Well, 
Use simple words. Try and avoid things like jargon. And and again, I'm trying not just to read through the bullet points here, but don't just read what's on the slide. People can look at it and they can see what it is, the, the key points you're trying to make. The key thing for me is when you are delivering your presentation, it's that second last bullet point. Try and develop a wee bit of range in your tone of voice. Because if you are sitting listening to someone talking like this and reading through bullet points, it's so boring, so monotonous. So raising and lowering the tone of your voice can help engage with people. Good morning, how are you this morning? And then you're carrying on delivering the presentation. Um, one of the things I used to get feedback was that I tended to use my voice a wee bit too often. Um, so, <laughs> however, they did say it was good range of tone and pitch. The most irritating thing was that last wee point. If you've got a slide and it's got content on it, don't just talk to the bullets. There is nothing worse than hearing somebody just reciting what's actually on the screen for people to, to read themselves. So that for me was a really key thing. Don't just read the bullet points. We're going to get a wee chance to practice some of these things a wee bit later on. So non-verbal communication, it's really, really important if you're in an auditorium, you can gauge people's um, responses by, by you first coming in, smile and be yourself. You can stand and look square onto the audience. The key thing as well, when I used to get people asking questions, I would, as it says in the slide, move towards them because it helped them understand that you were engaging with them. Eye contact is always important. If you feel that some of your audience um, is losing a wee bit of interest, move towards them, smile at them, show a wee bit of eye contact, try and engage and get them back on board. And again, it's all about how you kind of make people understand that you're listening to them when, they're, when you're talking through your presentation. We'll just wait for this next slide. Teams and Zooms, what a nightmare. You can smile and be yourself and you can see laughing faces. However, as I experienced when we did the wee rehearsal with the committee, I kept saying, really bold, because in order to look down at the corner of the screen here, all you see is the top of my head. I've, I've hopefully tried to be a wee bit better, and I've got my laptop sitting on a couple of books just to lift it up a wee bit. makes me feel taller as well. But again, it's about think about how people are seeing you, what are they seeing. That's when I was this morning I said I wish I had a whole collection of books about kind of anatomy, physiology, presentation skills, saving the planet but I've only got a picture that my mother-in-law gave me in the background here for a wedding present. The thing that I'm looking now though is at the bottom of the screen is I'm looking at people's faces. I'm looking at are they smiling? Do they look interested? Do they look a wee bit bored? So again, with Teams and Zoom, that's probably easier because the, the few people that I've got on the screen at the minute, it's really easy to flick along and look at who's nodding, who's smiling, who's not. And I think for Teams and Zoom calls, it's probably best to try and have a mix of both where you be about asking people. You're looking a wee bit puzzled there, Shona. Is there something else I can explain about it for you? Or you obviously wouldn't say, Nikki, you look bored stiff. <laughs> have you lost the will to live? But you can gauge things through expressions. And one of the things is, um, I went on holiday to Wales recently, and when I was in Wales, I never realised how many speed cameras there were. I got caught doing 35 miles an hour in a 30 mile an hour zone. And fortunately in England and Wales, you have the option of, you can either pay a fine and get three points on your licence, or you can attend a speed driving training awareness course which was on Zoom, and I thought, hmm, that's only going to cost me £88, and I don't get three points on my licence. So I went for that option, and the chap that was presenting was really good, very professional, threw in a wee bit of humour now and again, but the one thing that uh, sticks out in my mind was, halfway through his presentation, there was a dog barking in the background, and the guy took it in his stride and he went, sorry about that, folks, the window cleaner's here and the dog doesn't like him. But again, when you're on Teams and Zoom, it's probably important to think a wee bit about background noise. Um, and, and again, if you've got a dog or you've got a wife that might irritate you and ask if you want a coffee halfway through a presentation, just think a wee bit about the things that may interrupt the flow of your presentation. 
So again, these are all things that makes teaming difficult. But again, the principles are smiling, try to be yourself, trying to make sure that you 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 allow people to kind of ask you questions, things like that's really important. Dealing with nerves. I was terrified before I came on this presentation this morning. And I don't think it's normal that you, you that you're if, if if you hear people say, No, I'm okay, everything will be fine, then can I tell you honestly they're lying. But nerves are really they're good. If you've got that wee adrenaline surge, it helps keep you focused because then that means you're thinking about right, I've not got time to fluff my words here. I'm in this situation where I need to do what I'm here to do. So it, uh, the, the nerves help does help sometimes to keep you focused. The wee thing I would give you is some practical tips. If you are nervous and you tend to shake a wee bit, hold on to something. So if you've got a lectern in front of you, keep a hold of it. If you tend to um, swing your legs like Elvis Presley and do the kind of shaky leg movements, again, just try and control some of your, your, your body movements. Prepare thoroughly and know your stuff. And again, I keep coming back to believe in yourself. Practice, practice. You know the topic. So again, these are all things that help you deal with nerves. I wonder if at this point, Shona, I could, or I could maybe just ask if anybody could give us a wee bit of feedback on how they deal with nerves. When we did this in the face-to-face -face sessions before, we would ask people to say, what is it you currently do, whether it's in your clinical practice or in your presenting that helps you control your, your nerves a wee bit. So is it possible to do that? Just to see if people can give us some kind of information. I'm just trying to break up the death by PowerPoint here, concentration level. I've got Liz's behind. Well, sorry, hand. you want to, have you got your hand up? Sorry, my wee mute button was pressed. We're not doing too well here, am I? <laughs> no, don't worry. It was just to say that um, we talked, I'd, I've been in many of your presentations, Liz, and we talked about when you start to talk and you get a really dry mouth and then you kind of stumble over your words and you can't get them out. Um, I used to play in a brass band mm. and if you were at the front and centre and you needed to play a solo and your mouth was dry before you were to start, you had to lick your teeth. <laughs> so if you, if you lick your teeth like that, you get your saliva glands going. That's right. So you can wet your lips and you can speak. So I would always lick my teeth before I start speaking. I have used every time I've been teaching people how to deliver presentations and then encouraging them to lick their teeth. And it really does work. Anybody else got any other things that they do to try and help them relax? I've maybe missed this last um, because I just had to take a phone call there, but just that bit, you've already touched on it, like just movement. So I'm like a really shallow breather. And then mm -hmm. if you're nervous, that becomes faster and faster and faster. You can feel yourself tipping into that like panic mode. But I find if I don't just stay at like the podium or just in one spot, if I move a little bit, that, that makes a big difference just to kind of help. Movement is just a bit more relaxing, I think, than standing still and then all the tensions in your shoulders and my shoulders end up wrapped around my ears and I get more and more nervous. Yeah, I think coming back to what Liz said and what you're saying, Pauline, have a wee glass of water by the podium so that if your teeth licking isn't working, you can at least get a wee sip of water. And Pauline, I think you've heard for me, when you're a bit nervous and apprehensive, your breathing air becomes very rapid your neck and your shoulder muscles and something as simple as like just drop your shoulders take a few deep breaths try and relax have a wee drink of water just to help calm yourself down a wee bit there was one technique that somebody said they used before they did a presentation they went into a toilet and did star jumps just to try and get them relaxed a wee bit before they went in so by the time you've licked your teeth dropped your shoulders and done your star jumps hopefully that'll help you cope a wee bit with the nerves it, it, probably t time's ticking on a wee bit, Shona. It, well, it Jilly, like, Jillian's, put, Jillian's put belly breathing in the chat. I'm belly breathing. Uh, it probably depends on the size of my belly at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but no, using the diaphragm and trying to breathe rather than kind of like um, breathing really rapidly out. So 
I think it's important that people share what are the things that help me deal with nerves. Um, and again, it's about believing in yourself because right back at the beginning, I said, you know the topic, you've presented it to your colleagues, you've used a wee bit of peer support, you've probably gone through your slides again and again and again. So that should all help you cope with your nerves. Breathe deeply, lick your lips, start jumps. These are all things that, that will again help you deal with the nerves actually on the day. And don't worry because when you're delivering and people can genuinely see you're nervous, they will probably still take the content of your presentation. But amongst themselves, they'll be saying, oh, she was really nervous, poor soul. So people will understand if you're a wee bit nervous and apprehensive, particularly if it's your first time doing with it. But nerves are good. They keep you focused. Try and enjoy it. And at the end of the day, if you're only on the stage for 10, 15 minutes, I'm sure you can probably control your nerves better than you think you would. So final thoughts and tips. If you are not sure about what you want to do next in terms of the work or the project that you've done, maybe put a slide up that asks people, so what do you think we need to do? What will our next steps be? How will you take the information from what I've, I've shared with you and put it into your clinical practice? And in terms of your project, if you're not quite sure what direction that's going to head in, will you be repeating it or progressing it? It's maybe getting the audience feedback to say, was this worthwhile? Did I enjoy it? Can I see the improvements to my clinical practice or patient care? So again, maybe getting them involved a wee bit in this. So what do you think we should be doing next? And I think that's a nice way just to round off your presentation. And that's before you get to the questions thing. So, our next steps. Now, this is the bit that I love. We've talked a wee bit about how do you plan and prepare for a presentation and what are the things that you shouldn't do and things that you should do. So, what I've done here is I've prepared a wee special presentation and I'm going to deliver it using as many of the don't do's or shouldn't do's as you can. And this is where I think it'd be good to have your wee pen and paper at the hand. If you can jot down the things that you spot that are terrible about this presentation, and then we'll get a wee bit of feedback, because I think by doing this, we understand and have a wee bit more confidence about what, how, like the what and not to do. So are we good to go? Yep. Oh, hang on a minute. Right. We'll test this out. This is a, a, a presentation. It's way out of date. It's a long time since I've done it. So just bear with me. I still think it's important that I share some information with you about this. We had this thing called the Cleanliness Champions Programme, and it was about how to make sure that people didn't die because of hospital infections. So I'm just going to run through the PowerPoint with you. And there's some key messages. What is it all about? Well, you can see on the screen there that it kind of affects quite a lot of patients in Scotland. I need to keep telling you this is way out of date, by the way. I probably should have updated these figures, but I've been so busy with things that I've not had a chance. So anyway, if you bear with me, these are the things that, that are important to know about cleanliness champions. It all kind of started a wee while back. Um, and, and I think, again, it's a programme that has got some key result areas. Um, what? No, I'm not wanting coffee. So, what am I talking about here? Oh, jeez. Hang, hang on a minute. I'll deal with that phone call later. Um, if you just wait a wee minute, I'll wait until the bullets come up. Oh. Learning approaches. This is good. You could either do it by using e-learning. Um, and I think in this day and age, everybody's into Zoom and Teams and all this IT stuff. So e-learning was a good way of learning about um, things that you needed to learn about. The other way you could do it was CD-ROM. <laughs> That's a bit prehistoric, isn't it, in this day and age? However, you might still be able to get some CD-ROMs. Like, these are the wee round disk things that you can shove into your computer. You couldn't use them on your laptop, though. Um, I think it's... Another option would be a hard copy workbook. I'm one you know, of these old fashioned people that like today when things kind of go wrong, you've always got a wee diary or a bit of paper or something that you can um, fall back on. It's about belt and braces, really. 
there's a lot of support for people that are doing cleanliness champions and it's really important that you understand the key mechanisms that are there to try and help you get through the programme. So I've put the bullet points here for you to see and I hope you can um, get a good idea of what, what there is in the way of support. And then, um, um, hang on, um, the role of the champions, this is crucial, it's really important that you understand that you're there as a role model. What you've not to do is focus on bad practice because if you focus on bad practice, you forget the good. But quite often it's bad practice that um, leads to home action. So you still need to be aware of the bad practice so that you can improve things. If you don't think about bad practice, then like you're probably never going to change anything. <sighs> Jeez. Many of these is a... So the story so far works no. Now you need to remember that this is way out of date, this presentation. I'm just checking the time, hang on. It's way out of date, but I still think it's important because it's not about the content of this, it's about the presentation itself. Although I still think it's probably good to have a wee bit of understanding of the programme. Now, I'm running a wee bit short on time, so I'm going to skip this slide because there's, I mean, progress today, if it's way out of date, there's no point in having the slide in. I don't want you to think that cleanliness, and champ clean clean cleanliness champions was an onerous thing, and there wasn't a lot of work involved in it. I mean, basically, we will continue to promote the program and the champions. The the images I've got here are that's the original kind of work. Try to get this organised and set up. But as you progress through it, it does get an awful lot easier. Now, finally, points to remember. I think it's really important. Oh, um, hang on till I flick through to get to the bit. Oh, sorry. Where's the wee thing going? Oh, right. So these are the things that you really need to remember. And I think the key thing for me is at the end of your presentation, stick a picture of a wee dog or a wee animal on, because people will have a laugh at the end of it and they'll think, what a really good presentation that was. Did you see that wee dog? So that'll do for me. Hope you've got a lot out of the presentation. Keep remembering the wee dog and remembering all the wee bugs and insects, because then that'll make sure that you didn't have any bad practice when you're practising. Okay, thank you very much for listening. But no, there's no time for questions. If you get questions, just send me them in an email or a CD ROM. <laughs> okay. How did that go for you guys? If we can flip now and think about what kind of things did you spot that wasn't right with the. You may have needed um, more than one piece of paper, I think. Gillian. Um, so you had spelling mistakes and your font was too small and you were going too fast. Um, and you had bugs all over your pictures. <laughs> without remembering it. Um, so it wasn't very nice to look at. And you're basically saying you weren't that interested because there were many more slides were left. Yeah. It was rubbish. It was rubbish. <laughs> it was rubbish. <laughs> Dreadful. Remember at the beginning, Julian, I said, think back to present presentations you've been on that were rubbish. And then what am I going to do to make sure that nobody's on the other end of my presentation thinking that was rubbish? Anybody else pick up and think? I tried to throw lots of things in for you. The, uh, the slides were absolutely awful. All different fonts, different sizes. Couldn't see half of them. Spelling mistakes uncovered. Um, nothing that would make you want to actually look at them, I would say. Okay. Yeah. And I think that, that was the good thing about when we had the rehearsals. It gave people the opportunity to get back from the other participants on that font's too small. Why have you got that animation? Because it's distracting. Could you not reword or rephrase that three um, paragraph thing into maybe a couple of key points? So I think you're right. All, all the things like the, the spelling and the animations and the font and the, the size and colour of the font, it's really important to get all that right. But well spotted. If you were in the room with me now, I'd give you a chocolate sweetie. <laughs> Sarah's got her hand up. 
Yeah, um, for me, I had absolutely no idea what you were talking about. It was really hard to follow. There wasn't an outline at the start to really explain what it was about or what we were expected to get at the end. So, yeah, I struggled to follow it completely. Right. So w- what what learning did you take from that? Uh, uh, the presentation, what did you learn from That it needs to have a structure. Um, so going back to what you'd said at the beginning about the introduction, thinking about what you want them to, to understand and get out of it at the end and follow that throughout. Yeah, all the things that we covered in the first few slides, I um, didn't do one of them. I had my wife prompted to come in and make my phone ring. She came in and asked me if I wanted a cup of coffee. And again, that's really important. You wouldn't get that in face. But in a Zoom call, things like that can happen. So it's, again, trying to make sure that there's none of that when you're, when you're setting up. Now, I can assure you that my phone wouldn't have rung because it would be off. I wouldn't be drinking coffee because I've got my water here and I'm all prepared. And I think probably in terms of time, um, we need to kind of, again, try and round this wee bit of this session off. I think even if we finish a wee bit sharper, Shona, would that be okay? We've yeah. got one last question from Lorraine, who's saying, would you recommend images, which I think is quite a good point related to your presentation there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the images I was using in that one of bugs and insects and beekeepers were obviously the wrong kind of images. You want to promote kind of health care and um, health improvement infection and things like that. You don't want to promote all the bad stuff. Images you need to be careful with, though, because if you're presenting spreadsheets or screenshots and things like that, if you enlarge them too much to fit on the screen, they become really quite blurred. I'm going to smile at you, Pauline. I got your snapshot of the, inf- the screenshot of the information about people's experiences, and I really struggled to read it unless I magnified it a few times. So, again, your images are good because there are some people that respond well to bullet points and language and written information. But sometimes a really good image showing how something happens or works um, is useful. You just need to be, again, wary that your image is representative to the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. And, again, the idea of a wee funny dog wearing glasses at the end, nobody's going to remember that and as soon as they've left the auditorium. So images, yes, but make sure they're appropriate. And again, have a wee look at them and think, is it is it clear? Can I make it bigger? Can I make it smaller? But what's the point of having it? Is it there to, to reinforce something I'm saying? That's great, Les. Thank you. Les, I'll share my screen again and let you tie this bit up. OK, good. Thanks for everybody for chipping in a wee bit there. And I'm sure there'll be lots of other things um, that you'll have picked up. So what I've done now is I've revisited the content of this PowerPoint and I've tried to put it into a much more succinct way of delivering the information. Now, I'm not going to talk through PowerPoint slides, but I'm just going to pick up on some of the things. If this was the first slide that I put up in a presentation, would it be clear what the presentation is about? Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And I think, again, the title, it may be a wee bit long there, but it's something that will grab people's att- attention. It's a national initiative. It's about reducing hospital acquired infections. So straight away from the outset, you know what I'm going to be talking about. And as I say, I'm not going to cover each of these slides. I'm just going to flick through. Oops, I've lost control. Oh, there we go. I'll flick through them again. Here are ways of learning. This is the champion's role. Again, it's really clear because my font is sans serif. It's highlighted in bullets. It's aligned to the left. Easy for people to read. I've tried to limit the amount of information. And going back to what you were saying around things flying in and font no being good and hard to see. So again, just revisiting your slides, making sure uh, my background is in ophthalmic nursing. One of the best contrasts to help people with visual impairment is black and white is the best contract. It's quite nice to have colours in the background of your slides and have like nice animated logo things on it. But again, if you want to make it easy for people to read black and white and, and simple. 
So again, this is me just sort of flicking through some of these slides to show you. Um, in the first wee one when I did it, I had the word bad practice higher. Spent more time talking about bad practice than I did. Very subtly here, I've put the negative stuff at the top so that when I'm finishing this slide off and I'm talking about it, I'm talking about the more positive aspects and reinforcing them rather than having it the other way around, which I think is a wee tip. In the next slide, again, ongoing work, it's about a set of wee bullet points. If I was revisiting this now, I might even, there's maybe too many bullets on this, but it's better than what I had before. And again, the font is nice and clear and it's really easy to see and really easy to remember. I've taken all the piles of paperwork out of that last slide as well. And I think you'll agree when we talked about images, this is probably a far more appropriate image to have on a, a slide about hospital acquired infections at the end rather than a wee dog with big googly eyes. So does that seem OK for you? Yeah. So again, this is the kind of the bad and the good. So maybe even if the good helps you by flicking through and looking at like the, the, the font size and the number of bullets and that kind of thing. I'm hoping you will remember me as one of the worst presenters you've ever seen or heard. Because if you just think back to me here with interruptions and flying images and things like that and no really paying attention, I wasn't even looking at some of the people on the screen. If you remember all those things, when you go into do your presentation and you know what you're talking about and you're feeling a wee bit confident, then that, that's me kind of done my job. Is that OK? That's brilliant. Okie dokie. I'm getting lots of nodding heads here, so this team stuff does work, basically. That's good. I'm okay. just going to unshare my screen. Okay. We're going to have a, a coffee break, but I just wondered if there's any any last comments or questions for Les. It's really good to see the contrast, Les, between the two presentations. And I've seen that, I don't know how many times now, the the crazy presentation and the, the improved one, and I learn something new every time and think about it. Um, Lorraine, you've got your hand up. Sorry, Liz. No, it's OK. I'll let Lorraine. Uh, uh, hi, sorry. I just wondered how you're finding the teams uh, being a presenter and having someone else hosting in the back and forward. And is it best to be the host and presenter or I don't? Yeah, I'm yeah. just about to do one of these. So I'm wondering how you what, what you've thought of how it works. Yeah, I think I was lucky because Shona and the girls invited me to do a wee practice on it. From from up front, I was honest and said that I'm new to Teams. I've not used it very much, so bear with me. Like I said, if things are going to go wrong, technically, they'll go wrong. And it's about how do I just remain calm when I'm doing it? I think if you're doing it for the first time, It'd be like me sitting here now. I'm still trembling and I cannot wait to have this wee coffee break just so that I can slow my breathing down, drop my shoulders, lick my teeth and drink my water. So, I mean, it's it's really complicated. I fully understand how difficult this will be. If I was in a face-to-face -face group with people, trust me, you would be so relaxed, so calm. Wrong. It's easy to manage in a face-to-face -face because you build in something. It's much harder on this. If I'm being honest with you, I've really struggled because when you get responses for people, they're delayed. The slides are a bit slower and a bit delayed. Having done this now once, I know that if I came back to do this again, I would be much better because I've learned some of the things that I shouldn't do and, and that kind of thing. So does that answer your question or...? So just wondering, what do you think of the things that you wouldn't do again? Lorraine, I think I was just, the, the stuff that Les is reflecting on is really interesting. I'll let him come back in a wee second, but just to kind of give you a bit of background to, Les has done amazing because he hasn't used Teams, but we put in a couple of things to try and support with that. And one of them you've maybe noticed is that I've, I'm sharing the screen so that Les didn't have to do that and giving Les control and it's not working the way it did in practice. And that, I suppose for me in Teams is one of the big, can you hear me okay? Yeah, one of the big lessons is that with Teams, you don't know how it's going to go. So I think what Les is saying and trying to keep yourself calm, trying to communicate in terms of communication, what's your mute buttons? Um, because when your nerves crank in, 
you sometimes forget to put them off and you might have two mute buttons. So you'll have your button maybe on your earphones and the one on the screen. But there's so much to think about, as you say, Les, it's complicated. But one of the things I would say is practice is the same for teams as it is for for the other setting and in terms of the control issue for me the lesson maybe is if you are presenting maybe keep control um that was something that we didn't want to have to, let's have to think about and we thought we were being kind but i think we've maybe made it a little bit harder in some ways um so there's lots of lots of things to think about Lorraine. but i think the main thing is if you can stay as calm as you can and just communicate what what the problem is, maybe if, if you lose the presenter or you lose somebody's voice or just say what you see or say what you hear. Yeah. Can I just add a couple of wee things there? When Shona invited me back, which I'm delighted because I love my AHP colleagues and I, I miss my practice and miss being in healthcare. Did I tell you I'd retire? <laughs> But the, the things Shona did offer, did, did I want her to with the PowerPoint? And I would say things like next slide or moving on. I thought that would have been really even harder for me. I wouldn't have been able to kind of think what's coming up next. Whereas maybe if I controlled the slides in the presentation myself, even although there was a delay, the fact that a title came up at the top of the slide, it gave me a chance to think. Right, this is what's coming next. I think I was happier having control rather than relying on somebody else. And even although we had kind of technical issues, the fact that I knew there was somebody in the background that was controlling them and trying to help me out, at least then I could focus on delivering the presentation. And the last wee thing is I was honest, I would say things like, oops, I've lost control. Oops, I've missed you. Oops, I can't hear anybody. So again, it's just about being honest with people and that'll help you relax a wee bit as well. Is that is that enough? Is that okay? Yeah, that's good, please. Good. good. Pauline, you've got your hand up and then John's got his hand up after. Yeah, no, I was just I was telling everybody at the practice session the story of I was on a webinar that was delivered by Microsoft about using Teams for mental health using virtual technology. And it crashed halfway through. The presenter disappeared off screen. Somebody had to jump on. And it was the best thing ever because it just normalised it. It's like, this is just going to be part of our life. This is part of presenting. Yeah. If Microsoft can't get it right, then we shouldn't be worrying about trying to be the most perfect professional out there. I think we just need to kind of ride along with it, not view it as the worst thing that can happen, but potentially it's just a thing that can happen. So your backup plans about how to rejoin and what to do. The other thing was just a wee top tip. If you're doing a practice session, use the record function so that you can see yourself back again. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's quite helpful just to see what you look like in your own expressions on, on Teams. Thanks, Pauline. And you've put, you've put a thing in the chat, uh, some top tips as well. That's good. John. Yeah, thanks. Just to mirror what, what Pauline was saying, um, uh, experience recently of presenting on teams and for some reason my um you know sometimes good things can happen at a disaster and for some reason my, my slides wouldn't share so I, I still had them on another screen so i could read them so i just presented to the audience and uh, it was perhaps a more effective presentation because of that because i wasn't nobody was reading slides and it was much more interactive so it, it's for me, it, it gave me a consideration that there's there's more than one way to deliver a presentation. You know, I think it, it, that is a possible way of delivering a, a presentation to a bunch of people like this. And it means yeah, you yeah. can see the whites of their eyes and make them interact a little bit more, um, as opposed to making them just stare at PowerPoint slides. So it's just, just a thought. Yeah, as opposed to going back to, you know, I was saying, have your presentation, your laptop, be familiar with equipment a backup so the backup for me when i was delivering face to face was a hard copy yeah. because then a bit like yourself if people couldn't see my slides and whatever at least i had the the slides there with me that i could at least talk to so it's thing. and and i think you're right because i'm sure people find me much more interesting than powerpoint presentations and bullets as i'm sure they'll have found you more interesting not that you weren't i'm digging a hole here for myself isn't i would say though that for that that first 20 seconds, there wasn't enough water or teeth licking in the world. You know what I mean? It was a little bit uncomfortable, but it was a, a good lesson to learn that, you know, if it does go horribly yeah. wrong, well, you just have to click into something else and, and move it on from there. Absolutely. And I'll just say yeah. this, if something's going wrong, it will. 
and you need to be prepared for that and anticipate it. That's a good point. That's a good point. But it is, it's a lonely, it's a lonely space, isn't it? <laughs> when it first goes wrong, thinking what we're we going to do, what we're we going to yeah. do. But I think it's just remembering that the people in the virtual room are actually, they got your back as well, um, as they would face to face. Thank you so much.